Welcome back to part two of a conversation with Rick Bragg. In this particular part of the interview, he's talking about his work as a journalist with the New York Times, the story that sticks with him the most. And he's also a writing professor at the University of Alabama. He calls himself a fake professor, but he's going to offer teachers and students his number one piece of advice for becoming a good writer. Hope you enjoy. Hey, if you're enjoying the podcast and you want to join our Facebook community or our Patreon community, please follow the links in the show notes. You can subscribe on our Patreon community and get bonus content and early access to episodes. Another way you can support us is by purchasing the Talkin' Appalachian desk calendar on Etsy. It's one word or expression a month for 12 months. You get 12 Appalachian words and expressions and you get to support the podcast at the same time and it's still early enough in the year that you can grab a calendar for yourself or a gift for someone else and enjoy it all year long and that's on Ivy Attic Company on Etsy all the links will be in the show notes all the links are on our Facebook and Instagram communities we're also on YouTube now So please go on over there and subscribe, and you'll get my podcast episodes plus Southern Salon podcast episodes. Thanks, everybody, and keep talking Appalachian. You covered some pretty powerful stories when you worked for the Times. What's the one that sticks with you the most? You know, that's really hard to say. And if you ask me this question tomorrow, it'll be a different answer than today because it all depends on what has resurfaced, you know, in your memory. I don't think it reporters... I can't say this about reporters. I don't get to speak for them. I don't think that it's right for me to say, oh, it was so awful on me. Because at the end of the day, or the end of the week, or the end of the month, or sometimes at the end of three months or five months, you get to go home. Unless it is a tragedy like the one that has happened just recently. Sometimes reporters don't get to go home. And more and more... You know, I can't even tell you what that that how much respect you have to have for for those people. But but at the end of the day, you know, in Oklahoma City with 167 people dead, I get to go home. You know, at some point I get to go home. And I may have to go back, but I get to go home. And then there are all those people there who, you know, like the lead of one of the stories out of Oklahoma City was when they convicted Timothy McVeigh, but they did not yet execute him. I never believed in the electric chair or or lethal injection until then, until then. And uh, because I talked to so many people. And the lead of one story was after he was convicted, there was no real relief for them because he still walked this earth. So the lead was uh, after the blast, they learn to write left-handed, to tie just one shoe. They learned to look in the mirror at faces that made them want to cry and to cry from glass eyes. They learned in houses that once rang with the sound of children to stand the silence. And they learned to sleep with pills or to sleep alone. But mostly they learn that any kind of healing would only come at the edge of McVeigh's grave. That will always be bad. I was in New York right after. I didn't write anything. I wrote one little short story after 9-11. 9-11 was just off the scale of our our understanding. And then I went to the Pakistan to write about the genesis of that hatred. And uh, that was that would break your heart. You know, I covered Haiti and awful times of, of, of murder, mutilation. But I think the one that, that sticks with me as much as anything was the Susan Smith trial because it was small enough, even though two babies, two children lost their lives, it was something you could get your head around. And because of that, you couldn't get your head out of it either. And it, and, you know, and, and you just came to just, People that say that, that the people who write about this don't have feelings about it or aren't invested in it. I want, you know, I, I, it, you know, it broke my heart. It broke everybody's heart. So I think that one, because of the darkness, the, 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 the darkness of the human spirit, and to do that was it for, for me. But yeah, I could depress everybody in here if I kept talking. <laughs> you know. 
So you teach in the communications department, Until right? they raise their standards. <laughs> What advice do you give students about journalism or about writing in general? It's a common question for... Well, first we got to get them to come to class. Then we got to get them to like come to class and not play on their phone. You got to get them out of their cell phone. You know, read Dickens, read A Christmas Carol. What a beautiful time of the year to read A Christmas Carol. To read a moral tale. Written for money. Written for money, but a moral poem almost. Read To Kill a Mockingbird, one of the great moral tales of our time. Read, um, read Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove, one of the great adventures of our time. Read Eudora Welty's short stories, Where Is the Voice Coming From? One of the best things ever written on the civil rights movement. You know, read and, and get smart. doesn't matter if you're going to write for a living. Just get smart and be smart in something else you do. You will not be so looking at a lot of pictures of cats. So what I tell them is this. Let's do a little test. How many of you have uh, ever had one of those rice cakes that you buy in the grocery store? They used to, people used to say they were healthy. Did you enjoy the rice cake? How many of you have had sausage gravy on a biscuit with maybe a little side, maybe with some sliced tomatoes or some cantaloupe, right? Or something like that. Some scrambled eggs or two good fried eggs, you know, some grits with maybe just a little tiny bit of not cheddar, because cheddar don't melt, but some good, cheap American cheese, you know, and maybe a little tiny bit of cayenne pepper. All that on a plate. How many of you would enjoy that? Well, that's what writing should be. Writing should be redolent with color and imagery and detail. And I think a lot of people, especially in journalism, Teach writing as though it should, and believe me, there's great debate over this. Uh, I'm sure they've used me as an example of the Antichrist in this, but, but you know, the, people say, save it for your novel. Well, I can tell you right now, that's a poor idea. You know, writing should be rich. It should be as, as redolent, as rich, as is true, you know. When you're a kid and they hand you the crayons and the coloring book, they say, don't color outside the lines. Don't color outside the lines, but inside those lines, it needs to be as colorful, as captivating as it can be. So one thing, dull, as far as I know, has never sold a book. I mean, nobody's ever said, I just love his stuff. It's just so dull. You know, I just love his stuff. He, you know, I went. I got eight copies of his book to give out for Christmas because he is just so spare and stark and dull. Now, spare and stark can be beautiful. Faulkner said of Hemingway, "Poor Hemingway, who has never once sent someone scurrying for a dictionary." And then Hemingway said of Faulkner, "Poor Faulkner, who believes that big words bring big ideas." And they're both pretty well successful, but they came from different camps. But in Hemingway's stark prose is beauty. So it doesn't have to be gothic or flowery, but invariably what happens is because, and I blame the cell phone, because of the cell phone and the, and the video game uh, Spanish flu that pervades the... I have to teach, reteach a lot of... Basics, I have to, which makes me a really overpaid fourth grade grammar teacher. <laughs> now, in that mix of students are some of the best writers I've ever seen. We've got several students that have written books. We've got several students that have gone on to magazine life. I teach magazine writing. That's all they trust me with, and it's probably good. We've got two books that have got great national attention just recently from I call them young writers because they're in their like 30 they're like late 20s or 30 but so we got great ones but increasingly the fundamentals are not there and it's because of you know they they don't read they don't read like they used to and maybe it's because maybe I was just real dull but I don't think I am you know, I turned up, I turned a 1969 Camaro convertible, the pace car edition, the white one with orange stripes, got it for $1,400 in 
in the 70s when it was just an old car. I turned it upside down at more than 100 miles an hour. You know, I have seen a holy man's call to prayer across the desert. I have, again, been sh- shot at and scared to death and and survived two mean brothers and got bit by a snake. I mean, I've had a good life. I could... No, I mean, really, that's a good life. I've... I glued myself to a wall once. By God, top that. I crawled up under, crawled up under 1969 Mustang with a 302 engine. It would fly. Crawled up under it to get away from a guy who was beating me to death because I took his girlfriend to a football game. I might have deserved it, but there's a point to every ass whipping where it just reason needs to set in. I had a good life. I would not have had that life staring at a tiny screen. I just wouldn't have had a life. You know, A, go out and live some life. B, spend just a little bit of the time that they would spend doing other things, you know, to just continue to read. And it's funny because they want to write, you know. And again, I got to stress and roll tide, we got some great writers. We got some of the best that I've ever seen. We've got some that may not be great writers, but they're going to be great professionals. They're going to make a good living in this craft, even with the craft being under siege like it is. And then I got a handful every now and then, one or two, that if you stuck the flashlight in their mouth and clicked it on, the beam would come out the back of their head. And, And to them, we all say... Bless their heart. And, uh, and, uh, and then we just go on. Sometimes, you know, just luck, happenstance, plays such a big role in what happens and how you develop. And, for instance, my older brother Sam worked 17 years in a cotton mill. He opened the bales of cotton with bolt cutters, and he wore what looked like a suit of mail but to keep the... Because when you cut the bands... They explode out with thousands of pounds of pressure, and they stab people. You know, he was stabbed right here and almost lost an eye, but it it just happened to be that far down on the cheekbone. And and, uh, he, you know, and he worked all those years because when we were children, and my daddy and you know, and my mom split, and my mom had us walking down a railroad track with our clothes in in paper bags you know, to get away. He, my brother Sam, being three years older than me, immediately became the man. And he worked in a coal yard. He, he became the man. He cut the wood to heat the house. He, he, he is the man. But he heard some great stories. He heard them and he will repeat them with prodding. But he, you know, he's a serious Southern man. And he just, you know, he think again. They don't think I have a job. You know, they think I'm a. I don't know. I think they. I think they imagine me as Tiny Tim. Remember Tiny Tim? <laughs> you know, not Tiny Tim from uh, Dickens, but remember the, you know, playing the ukulele, and singing "What Tiptoe Through the Tulips with Me." I think he thinks that's more or less what I do, and and he knows I've been to. The, the greatest gift he ever gave me that showed me that he understood what I did was I had been badly, uh, I was all right. But every now, you know, a rock coming into contact with your head is a serious thing. And although I had hit him with many rocks as a child, but in a, a riot, in a, it was a race riot in Miami, I got hit right here with a, with a rock of good size. It's actually a chunk of concrete. You know, it was a, it was a near thing. And that Christmas, he gave me a uh, a logger's helmet, and a bright orange logger's helmet with a plastic face shield. Yeah, you know, with with just two words or three words for them riots. He never had a chance t- to do more with his storytelling. My little brother Mark is sitting in a big seat. You know, he's been shot. He's been stabbed. He's you know he he's fought men all his life. He's he's. You know, he's a hard drinker. God, the stories he could tell. But in his culture, it's more important that he be able to lay a straight low of blocks, you know, 
He raises hogs. And he's got these two hogs. And he lives about 38 acres away from my mom's house. He said, I think I'll get me some hogs. And I said, well, that's a, that's a good idea. Get you some hogs. He put the pen two feet from his front door. I mean, the stories he could tell. But they didn't, either one of them, neither one of them, enjoyed reading as a child. They did not read. And I did because I did the same things they did. I love cars. You know, I was the, the most ball hogginist guard that ever played for the Roy Webb Junior High School Hawks. You know, the, my other teammates would actually say, don't throw it to Ricky, he'll shoot it. Because I would shoot it. I saw no reason in playing defense or passing. And you know, we did all those things together, but, but, but they didn't read. And I read The Hardy Boys. I read... Um, you were there, books about the Alamo and the Bismarck and World War II. And uh, I just read and read and read. So that was the mitigating factor in their ability to... And they both quit school. Uh, I stayed in school because I didn't like work. You know, I did pick and shovel work. I worked right beside them. I... I you know, I did logging. I did pulp wooding. I'm glad. I'm glad to be in a place where I don't have to explain what pulp wooding is. You know, uh, I remember wading in. The bulldozers would. We didn't fell the trees. The bulldozers would push the trees down, and we'd wade into that mess of slick red mud and pine branches, and and every now and then one of them big timber rattlers, one of the big ones. The eastern diamondback is the biggest snake in America, if you don't count them visitors down in Miami. You know, those big uh, pythons, I think they are. But the, the, one of those big eastern diamondbacks, you could see them. You know, they didn't sneak up on you. You couldn't hear them because the saw would be running, but you would see them. And all you would have to do is hold the saw out, and they would commit suicide on it. You know, we all did that. We all did those things. I just happened to fall into a, and it had to do with luck. I was the middle boy instead of the firstborn. If I'd been the firstborn, I wouldn't be sitting here. I just had more luck than they had. You know, I, I, I didn't go to like New York City as a young man in my 20s, you know, to, uh, you know, walk through the village in a frayed, Button down and uh, with holes in my socks, but fashionably so, you know. And and as I ate Campbell's soup out of a can and tried to write the great American novel, I couldn't afford that. I couldn't do that. My first writing job was at the Jacksonville, Alabama News, uh, circulation fourteen hundred, I think. I got the job as the sports editor at eighteen because the guy they offered it to first had a real good job at the Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he did not want to give up that good paying chicken job to take a lowly job like a newspaper. And, uh, and then I went to a small daily. And I didn't finish school. I dropped out of school. And now you cannot do that today. Today, that scrap of paper is the key to the castle. That piece of paper is everything. But we're talking about the prehistoric era. You know, we're talking about 40 years ago or longer. And, and uh, I just kept moving, you know. But what it teaches you is, A, the fundamentals. Not just grammar, but style. It teaches you to write on deadline. It teaches you to write in a hurry. If you miss your deadline, then you have no value. If you miss your deadline, then... A, you're done. You miss it once, you might survive it. You miss it twice, three times, you're history. So you learn to write, I think. I would love to say it, 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 the discipline was really good for you, but mostly I was just scared of my editors because they were all tended to be little fellas. You know, they're mean. You know, little fellas will be mean to a big fella, especially if he's used a double negative. And uh, as I got older and did those stories for different places, they began to cross that line, that threshold, 
into more narrative. Like Twain. Twain crossed it, you know, like that. And so it ain't nothing new. I still read Twain sometimes now just to get the rhythms. Well, it's just, it's kind of like uh, dribbling a basketball or, or, or playing catch. The first time, second time you try to hurl that ball at someone, you're probably going to break a window, or many cases in my case. But it's a learned craft. How do you practice it? Well, you practice it by writing, but you mostly practice it by gleaning. You know, I love that word, you know, that, oh, gleaning. If, for instance, you know, and, and, and what I think what often happens is young people will say, well, I didn't want to read that stuff. You know, I didn't want to read that stuff. Well, fine. Try to graduate. But if, if your teacher assigns you old man in the sea, Barnes Hemingway, it's only that thick. There, it is no damn skin off your nose to, to read Old Man in the Sea, A Christmas Carol by Dickens. It's that thick. You can read it in between changing batteries in your cell phone. But then maybe you do read. Maybe you read Charles Fraser's Coal Mountain, which is one of the most beautifully written books, modern books out there. Read a poetry by Ron Rash about textile mills. Uh, read Walt Whitman. Read, you know, read Toni Morrison. Read, God, I mean, just read. The thing is, is that I think with teachers, obviously they won't expose students to, to good writing and good work. But maybe in the student's mind... The Harry Potter series hung the moon. Maybe in their mind. And if they read all the Harry Potter books, they can write. They'll be able to write because I think they're really well written. And, you know, if they read uh, maybe a thriller, maybe John Grisham is their ideal, maybe science fiction of any kind. I, I think that maybe teachers too, and I, believe me, I, I know better than to share any, to say, you ought to teach this way. Because uh, I'm a fake professor, but yeah, I mean, if they lo- if they want to read, give them an option of of the things that back in my era we'd say turn them on, but you know nobody knows what that means anymore. <laughs> but whatever brings them to the table, th- their finer nature, which I think can only be accomplished by reading. Larry Brown, uh, a great Mississippi writer, he's he's dead now. He said all the things that we worry about in our society, I feel, can be fixed by teaching our children to read. I cannot think of the great English writer who said, if you, and I, God, I wish I could remember his name. I got a coffee cup once because it had his name on it. But he said once that, and this we're talking about the 1700s, all the hardship and the pain and the agony that piles up around you in a lifetime. All the problems with family or, or poverty or crime or just meanness or the darkness of the human spirit, all those things are unbearable to you and make you feel as though you are alone in the circle of that darkness and then you read. And when you read, not only do you see that it is surmountable, you see how it is surmountable. And that's probably the fanciest thing I've ever said out loud.